Welcome back to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Last time we made our way toward a few of the dungeons, and we also did some of the trading sequence for Adult Link. And this time we're going to be finally entering the Forest Temple. Now, you can see at the beginning that this place is pretty ramped up compared to the child dungeons as we're starting with two wolfos, although they are pretty easy enemies. Same method applies as usual, just wait for them to spin around and then jump attack at their backs. The hookshot is going to be getting a lot of use in this dungeon, I mean, considering it's the first dungeon that we can have the hookshot in. You can use it to attach to a bunch of different things, vines or treasure chests, and like the boomerang, it could bring certain things toward you. Unlike the boomerang, it can't bring like perishable items, like enemy drops, such as rupees or hearts or anything like that, but it can definitely bring sculptural tokens, which is very useful because that would mean climbing all the way back up there, and that's annoying. Bringing yourself towards chests is also a viable option. Actually, I recommend it because I, I, I do like auto jump. It's just that sometimes it's pretty janky, I guess. And this is the first dungeon that has small keys. Keys, of course, opening doors. You can't use them in any other dungeon. So if you have a small key and you got it in the forest temple, then you can only use it in the forest temple. And, you know, they open locked doors, as keys are to do. As you saw there, I didn't need to wait for the Skulltrilla to turn around before I could kill him, because the hookshot can pierce through their hard shells, I suppose you'd call them. That doesn't apply for a lot of other enemies, though. Like, if they have a shield, or if they're like a wolfos and they block with their hands, then you can't really get through them with the hookshot. Those pose there, they stole the torches that, you know, held up this elevator, I guess. And now the elevator's gone down, so we need to kill them, get their torches back, so we can go down. Because that's how we're gonna have to get to the boss. That sculpture right there, it's pretty easy to miss. I mean, it's not in your peripheral vision, and your eyes are probably attracted to the door, because it's directly in front of you. You would want to go through it. And there's these enemies called bubbles, they're basically little skeleton heads that engulf themselves in flame it's not they're not too hard if you hit them with your shield by which i mean run into them with your shield they'll kind of go down to the ground and you can attack them at that point you can't attack them while the fire's up at least not now we can later these enemies are called stalfos they're another example of the sword and shield enemies which i you know i called wolfos those but that doesn't really count i guess stalfos are not difficult enemies in my opinion. The way you want to handle them is you want to get close to them and swing the sword in a specific direction. If you hold the control stick to the right, Link should do a swing from left to right and it'll kind of get past their shields because they hold the shields on the left unlike Link. It's pretty advantageous to be left-handed I suppose. And we found another small key. We already have two in the dungeon that's introducing us to small keys. It's pretty weird. Although it does get you used to the concept of, you know, you should probably stockpile these things because you never know how many locked doors there are gonna be. This area on the side requires that you play the Song of Time in order to move this time block. The other side has a similarly, you know, enclosed area or indented area, I suppose. But the door is locked rather than blocked by a time block, so you can't get in that way. And that is a giant Deku Baba. Although, they go down just as easily as the other ones. They might have a little more health, but they're not that hard. They also still drop Deku Sticks despite you being an adult and not able to use Deku Sticks. Which is kind of dumb, I think. There are some Skulltrulas on these walls. Or on this wall, rather. And... They are not friendly. This is, I guess, the first example where you're forced to climb up a wall that has a sculpture on it. Because, you know, in other cases you have a super long range weapon, like the slingshot. And that can travel pretty much as far as you can see. So, you can't take them all down with the hookshot. You're forced to climb up. And that's kind of intense because they're pretty erratic, I find, when it comes to spinning. And that means that they can probably, you know, come at you without you even knowing that you're not supposed to go up the wall. Well, that was a really long and drawn out sentence, but I'm going to keep it. Who cares? Q. 
killing that bubble open up this chest or showed this chest and we get the dungeon map pretty useful in this dungeon actually because the layout is well not the layout the way that they want you to finish the dungeon is pretty confusing there's gonna be a lot of weird backtracking for example right here this area is the opposite side of where the time block was where I said the door was locked and there was also a well on the other side if you probably didn't notice because I kind of skipped past it but in that well there was you know water and we need to step on that unique switch in order to drain the water I say unique because I'm pretty sure it doesn't appear anywhere else in the game it's a red switch red switches are basically toggable switches so if you step on it it'll of course like do something but if you step on it again it'll lift the switch back up so it kind of like bounces back up I suppose and it'll reactivate whatever the previous thing was so if I were to step on it again for some reason the water would go back up and the switch would go back up too kinda dumb I don't know how that would work but I don't know ancient highly in technology getting that sculpture has well was a pain but I've kinda figured out how to do it you need to hookshot onto the chest at like an angle at a very like 45 degree ish angle that way you kind of have enough ledge to stand on because if you come at it like straight on the side you'll fall off and you go at it at the front you can't really reach it so it's a weird angle I guess they wanted you to do that at a later point because there is an item that we will get that will help out with that probably but I decide to do it now because I don't know I don't like doing the game well I don't like doing what the game tells me rather now we're back in this previous room with three keys in tow and we're gonna need all three of those keys in order to get to the next area which is kind of weird like I suppose you can like open the locked door as soon as you get a key and then go back to get another key and like repeat that and that's kind of what I meant when I said this place was pretty backtracky like if you don't know that you need a lot of keys at one point like you need to kind of like hoard the keys then you're probably not gonna make a lot of progress fast in this dungeon you will eventually make progress but it'll be kind of a chore I suppose this room marks the first room in my opinion where we have an actual block pushing puzzle well it's not a very hard puzzle mind but it it does kind of rack your brain if you don't know what you're doing Navi points out that there are arrows on the floor that show where you have to push the block, if it wasn't obvious already. And after you push this block forward, like all the way forward, which takes a really long time, kinda sucks that we don't actually get a way to push blocks faster in this game. Although, we do get a way to push bigger blocks. After you push that block into place, you want to climb this ladder because there is a second block in this area and if you try to push the blue block first then this red block is going to become a bit complicated we'll see why that is in a little bit or maybe a big bit because block pushing takes a while and hey look there's an arrow here that was underneath the block probably actually that's not true the way that they kind of trick you with this puzzle, again, using puzzle very uh, selectively, I suppose, is that they make you push this block first, or at least they make you think you should push this block first. Then you climb on top of it, and then you get into the area where the red block is. Now where that is, you you'd need to pull the red block out in order to get it to this point. But, of course, Link can't crush his body behind the block, so you can only pull it out a portion of the way. And then you have to realize, oh wait, there's, you know, another way that I can push this block so that I could get it all the way onto the wall. That way I could push it all the way over here and climb up. It's, it's not that mean of a trick. I mean, you'll probably figure it out pretty fast if you explore around. Although the ladder is kind of hidden. It's behind where the blue block is and... 
it's in a weird indentation in the wall, so I'm gonna blame you if you did take a little while. But you're just not exploring enough. Here, Navi gives us some use useless, I was gonna say useful, but that's not coming up yet. Useless information that the corridor is all twisted. Now she gives us some useful information and says that there are monsters that hang on the ceiling. Now, if you hang out in this room long enough, then a monster will actually come down from the ceiling. It'll be shown by a shadow, a big circular shadow around you. And Link doesn't have a circular shadow. He has two feet as his shadow. But if that shadow gets big enough, it'll come down on you. And if you don't get out the way, it will take you to the beginning of the dungeon, which kind of sucks because then you have to walk all the way back, which means more backtracking. Not that fun to deal with. The enemy in question is called a wall master, I believe. Or maybe it's a floor master. They're basically hands, bony skeleton hands that kind of try to take you away. Although only the wall masters try to take you away. I am going way too off topic from this fight. These two Salfos here, they're linked to one another. Huh. If you try to kill one without killing the other, and you take too long killing the other, then the other will reanimate. So what you want to do is you want to do four hits to one of them, because they take five. And then do five hits to the other, and then do the final hit to the first one. And that'll take them down pretty easily. Of course, you want to do the same thing as I said before, where you do a horizontal slash on the side that the shield isn't. And I'm having trouble opening this chest. Luckily for us, this chest contains a very important item, one that's required to pretty much beat every other dungeon in the game, except one. The fairy bow. I don't know why they call it the fairy bow. It's, you know, it looks like a regular old bow to me. But we could shoot arrows now. And it comes with 30 arrows for us. So, you know, we could be a wild gunslinger with our arrows being bullets and our bow being the gun. There are some hearts in those pots if you so need. Of course, I took them because I'm greedy and I just can't help myself when it comes to Zelda stuff. Like, if I see rupees and I have a full wallet, I'm gonna grab those rupees for absolutely no reason. Now, the pose will appear on these paintings in certain rooms. You want to shoot those paintings so that the Poe will actually appear. Standing at this point in between the stairs is probably the best vantage point because you have all three uh, paintings in view. Like, at least you have two of them and one behind your back. And if you get close to a painting, the Poe will disappear. So, you want to stand there because it basically guarantees that they'll either be in your vision or they'll be right behind you which you know it, it's a good vantage point now these pose of course they work on regular pose logic where if you try to lock onto them they'll disappear what i like to do is i try to chain hookshot shots onto them so i'll hookshot them once they'll f try to fly away from me but then i'll hookshot them more draw them to me and then they'll try to fly away again and just kind of repeat that cycle until they're dead. You could also try to snipe them out with arrows, but I don't find that as good a method. I don't think it's fast enough. And of course, I'm blue. I gotta go fast. Now that we're done with the backtracking to this room though, we need to backtrack a little more. I say that in a bad way because I know that people don't like backtracking for some reason. Or at least that's what I hear, that people don't like to backtrack. And I I don't mind it as long as I'm doing something new in that area, I suppose. Like, we're going to come back to this area, but we're going to do something different. For example, we're going to kill these skeleton heads because... Or bubbles, I should call them by the actual name. Because we have the arrows now, and that can both do damage to them and get them out of their fiery state. And also, there's a switch in this room, a pretty special switch. These silver switches, we actually saw one before. There was one in the Great Deku Tree, and what it did was it opened a door, but it doesn't really serve the same function as here. 
The thing that's the difference between the silver switches and the gold switches is that the silver switches are like red floor ones. They are toggleable. Toggleable. You can shoot it again and that'll get the eye to open back up and thus the room will become all twisted again. You actually can't make much progress in the room unless it's twisted. So the only reason we really did that was to get the boss key. And then we'll have to kind of go through an alternate path to get back to where we were. I say alternate path as if we don't need to go through it, but it's actually not optional. At least I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure there's a key that we obtain by going through this path, along with a giant Deku Baba. With the hookshot, you can actually stun them pretty easily and then perform an attack to get a Deku stick out of them, which isn't useful to Adult Link. I suppose going for the Deku nuts is more useful, but it's faster to get the Deku sticks, so of course I'm going to do that. Now these Floor Masters, at least I think that's the one, once you kill them, they split into three smaller ones, and then after you kill those three smaller ones, then it's actually dead. If one of the smaller ones eludes you, it starts to run around, and if it grabs you, it'll turn back into a big one. So the cycle repeats until you could kill all three of them, you know, efficiently. At least, you don't have to do it at the same time. I did, because I like spamming the circle spin attack, at least the fast spin attack rather. But you don't have to, you can pick them off one at a time as long as you don't get hit by them. That's the main thing. And this bubble is annoying. I kind of want to leave him, but I kind of want to kill him too because he's disgraced me. Luckily, I'm running out of arrows, but there is a chest in this area that has arrows. It's actually a chest that doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Because, you know, you could find arrows a bunch of different alternate ways, like killing enemies. But I've gotten this kind of new ideology where I want to make sure that when I'm done with the dungeon and I look at my map and I look at the, you know, what the compass shows me, which is basically where the treasure chests are, that there aren't any other treasure chests that I need to open, you know, just in case they have something valuable in them. I mean, they probably don't if I'm at the end of the dungeon, but it, it's like, it's like a blemish, I suppose, on my perfectly fair-skinned map. That was a weird analogy. Anyway, we're gonna go back to the room where we got the arrows, by which of untwisting the twisted, or no, retwisting the corridor that we untwisted, and then, you know, getting back to the room with the arrows, and then going to the other side, and beating another Poe there, because the way the dungeon is laid out, it kind of is reflected. Like, the left side is pretty similar to the right side, and we saw that at the beginning of the dungeon too, where there were the two indentations in the wall, both of which that had doors that were blocked by different things. One of them was an eye switch, where you had to uh, shoot the switch to make the gate go up, but I didn't take that door because I didn't have to. And the other one was a door blocked by uh, a time block. So, you know, the dungeon is pretty symmetrical, but it does require that you go back to one side in order to finish it up. Like, you get the dungeon item and then you go back through the dungeon again, pretty much. And again, people don't like that for some reason. I'm fine with it. In fact, I enjoy it. But I know it's a chore to others. This room is identical to the last one, so the same method still applies. You stand in between the two staircases and you shoot an arrow at the Poe. The Poe's actually make a noise if, uh, if their portrait is near you, and it's a different noise from when you shoot the portrait. It's kind of a higher pitched laugh if, you're, if you cause them to change without, you know, shooting the portrait down. So you'll definitely know if you screwed up. And of course I'm going to use my same method, although I'll screw it up because I'm bad at video games. The way the Poes attack you is that they'll kind of spin around with their flame and if they do that, they're invincible. Although, there is a way to stop them from spinning around if you block them with your shield or if you just take a hit from them. 
they'll stop spinning and be vulnerable to damage if they're not invisible. If they are invisible or if you're locking onto them while you block or get hit by them, they will turn invisible immediately after and then start spinning some more, so you'll have to wait a little longer. Though that isn't that much of a big deal, although some people might say it is, not gonna name names. Although, lots of people probably know who I'm talking about if they're watching an Ocarina of Time Let's Play. And now we got the compass, and I stupidly don't use the compass, and, you know, don't pay attention to which door I just came through, so I went backwards to go forwards. But it's not that big of a deal. This take was a good take, I'm keeping it. I have all the keys, and this room has another wall master. But it's not that big of a deal because we can kind of jump up to that other side and, you know, bypass any ladders or anything that might slow us down. So we might get caught by the wall master. Again, talking of the symmetry between the two sides of this dungeon, there was another twisted corridor which had a room with the wall master in it. However, in this room to flip the switch or to shoot the switch rather, you need to send an arrow through the fire to melt the ice. But the thing is, the thing that triggers the switch isn't the uh, the switch actually getting shot. It's the ice melting. So there are a couple things you can do to, you know, get that switch to turn on or off, depending on your viewpoint. Also, these bubbles can be just shot with an arrow and killed. They only take one hit. But I'm trying to talk. That switch over there... You can either shoot, you know, an arrow through the torch to make it a fiery arrow and, you know, switch it off like that. Or you can get up to that ledge where it was and use Din's fire. And since all it asks for is that you melt a switch, Din's fire works. It'll just, you know, do the switch for you without having to shoot an arrow at it. This room right here, the ceiling is collapsing and it looks like we're playing chess. There are sculptures around, but you can't really see that from when you enter the room. As you saw, I kind of went into the arrow view so that I could try to snipe out the sculptures, even though they aren't that much of a hassle. I find it easier in the 3DS version as well to snipe them out because I think their legs are a lot more visible, and the 3D might kind of help with that, although I don't really use the 3D. In this room, you need to shoot the painting as you usually do but there's only one instead we have this little block pushing puzzle it's a bit different and it gives you a minute to do it though it's not that difficult of a puzzle they do throw in like an extra block f as a red herring or blue herring because it's of the blue po but it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things you just push the other blocks into place to make a portrait on the floor of that po and also, if you screw up the puzzle, you can either exit the room and re-enter to reset it to this puzzle, or if you let the time elapse, then instead of doing the same puzzle, the blocks will sort of flip, and it'll give you an extra minute and 30 seconds in order to do that puzzle. So, you know, the game doesn't want you to fail the puzzle, I guess. If you do decide to lock onto the pose, and you, you know check out the Navi text for them, they'll actually have different names. The blue one is called Joel. The, no wait, the red one is called Joel. The blue one is called Beth. The green one that we're fighting right now is called Amy. And the last one, which is purple, is gonna be called Meg. I'm not sure if that's in reference to anything. I think it actually might be, but you know, they all have different names. What I think is pretty interesting about these Poe's that even though they have names and you know they're clearly distinct in terms of the shape of their cloths that surround their bodies, they don't drop souls. You'd think that they drop unique souls kind of like the Composer Brothers in Kakariko's Graveyard, but they don't. And also, since they don't drop souls and they don't have like the lanterns like regular Poe's or that Dompe has. I'm pretty sure Dompe has a lantern after he dies, although he also has a halo. Um, they kind of don't have anything to carry souls in because I'm pretty sure that's where 
the poles the pose carry their souls like if you kill them then the fabricy ghost thing disappears then the lantern falls and breaks and the soul is found inside enough about the souls this last poe meg she is unique in that her battle style is different rather than trying to spin and attack you immediately she will create four clones of herself and very easily you can tell which clone it is because that one will spin a little bit and after it's done spinning you can lock onto it and shoot it which will kill it in the 3ds version it's a bit harder because the screen is smaller and thus you can't really see all of the pose on screen at once but it's only one that you can't see so if you don't see any of them in your vision that spin it probably means that the one behind you is spinning so it's not a very difficult boss if you do take out all of the ones that aren't spinning then instead the one that you know remains which is the actual one will try to attack you and do a little bit of damage they'll attack you in the same way that the regular ones do they'll spin at you and of course they're invincible while they're doing that so you kind of you know you're gonna take a hit or you could block I suppose either way though once you defeat all of the pose this room will open you can ride the elevator down kind of looks like a Zelda 2 elevator well maybe I don't know the Zelda 2 elevator is actually just like two platforms that are suspended in midair I anyway this room rotates at least it looks like it does if you push the blocks on the side then you'll kind of push the way the room is arranged at least it looks like that you're pushing basically the walls of the room so you're making it so that the walls open at certain points and it'll show different openings and thus you can press the different switches in order to get to the final room this room has a couple of sculptures one regular one and one golden one so if you want another sculpture there you go if you end up turning the room the way I did, eventually the blue parts will come back to where they were, as in the blue floor panels will be where the holes are, and that will be pretty much the end of it because you'll have hit all of the previous switches and thus get you know access to the final room, although that room is locked so you need to hit one more switch. And the next room is kind of interesting because there's paintings in it and I'm pretty sure like the beta for this game was something similar to Mario 64 oh wait there aren't paintings in it that's only the 3d version anyway in the next room after that there's gonna be paintings okay in like the beta for Ocarina of Time they're gonna have something similar to Mario 64 where instead of you know having a bunch of dungeons you'd be in Ganon's Tower and there'd be a bunch of paintings that you go in and out of in order to you know progress through the game this is kind of I guess remnants of that and oh no it's a boss and it's Ganon interestingly enough he's wielding a trident well I called him Ganon didn't I it's Ganondorf but he's wielding a trident just like Ganon does in his you know fight in A Link to the Past he wields a trident there and also this isn't actually Ganon it's Phantom Ganon this isn't actually Ganondorf, it's Phantom Ganon. I keep calling him the wrong thing. His mask that he wears also resembles kind of a pig face, which Ganon also takes the form of a pig, so it's kind of fitting that he has a trident and a pig face. He tries to jump in and out of the paintings to attack you. If he does end up getting fully out of the painting, he will send a big electric shock along the floor, and if that hits you, you'll take a bit of damage. But if you're standing where I am, which is basically on one of the little Triforce panels on the floor you won't be able to get hit by it also you'll have a good view of the area he will send out two versions of himself one is slightly darker than the other I guess not as detailed the other is pretty you know clearly the real one so if you attack it then you'll do some damage to him and the horse will eventually disappear so now we actually have a game of dead man's volley at least that's what they call it in these games it's basically tennis and you can either use your sword to attack the energy balls and send them back at him or you can use a bottle I like to use the bottle because it's actually 
you know, better in terms of the way it attacks. When you use the bottle, its animation is longer than swinging a sword. So even if it's at the tail end of its animation, you can, you know, reflect the magic ball back, which is pretty neat. It's a weird thing to have in the game, but whatever. It gets the job done better, so I'm going to use it. Not just for comical effect, even though that is a really good reason to use it. And this is the first time, well at least when I was recording it, it was the first time, that I ever saw that drilling attack. I'm pretty sure it was at least. I've never seen it before. I have heard of it though. And I don't know what triggers it or why he did it, but I guess you learn something new every time you play the game. And with that last jump attack, he is dead. Or deader than before. I'm not sure if he was actually a dead person or something. Anyway, this dialogue right here, it's Ganon, although you probably can't tell because it isn't centered. Instead, it's from left to right, but whatever. Another interesting thing about it is that Ganon appears, or at least Phantom Ganon, appears as the young Ganondorf when you first see him. As you saw there, he appeared just as he did seven years ago. His appearance, you know, should change unless the Triforce makes you immortal, which would make sense. Anyway, first adult dungeon, first adult boss. Not too difficult. We're just gonna grab our heart container and leave this temple next time.